ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? The show starts in three, two, one, go. Good morning, Kane Sport. It's January 6, 2022. I'm Gary Furman, the publisher of Kanesport.com, joined as always by our managing editor, Matt Shodell, as we discuss the news of the day. And uh, the staff is continuing to come together. Uh, recruiting is ongoing. It's really going to hit overdrive next week as um, Mario Cristobal keeps pointing to finally getting some stability into his organization. And then they can really start sinking their teeth into rebuilding this program. Um, so Matt, uh, let's start out with the latest installment of our Why at the U series. Oh boy, not this again. Well, everyone's been having so much fun with these. We might as well start out with that, you know, and um, today's Why at the U is why could seven of the nine early signees in the recruiting class that are going to be arriving on campus, I guess, as soon as next week, um, why could seven of them potentially end up in the two deep this fall? And um, we attacked that a little bit. And uh, Matt, you know, I don't know what the number is. We, we use seven, you know, maybe it's six, maybe it's eight, who the heck knows. But the point of, the, of everything, I think, is this. And um, that's that the roster needs some help. It needs some fortification. And it's going to get that through recruiting this year, uh, not just what took place in the early signing period, but what's going to happen in this next uh, half of the signing period and in the transfer portal. Yeah. And for those that aren't aware, the classes begin January 18th. So we're still a good two weeks away from um, when kids will actually start classes at Miami. Just to... But they'll move in next week, I think. They usually point. move in the Saturday before the Monday. Just yeah. that's standard, you know, unless Mario Cristobal says <laughs> there's some way to get them on campus legally way before then. So your question about the uh, the newest installment of the of the Y at the U, it, it could easily have been just a few. <laughs> in, in, look, in in a good year when Miami's a really good team, there should be none of these guys on this list. And basically, what this list is saying to me is the roster's not good. Well, I've been saying and, that. Yeah, and I'm not saying you're wrong. Yeah. I'm, oh, good. You know, Good. Yeah. So you actually agree with me for a change. That's good. Uh, we always agree on everything, Gary. You know that. So back in the day, for the fans that just became fans like this year, there was none of this true freshman playing stuff. It used to be if you were a freshman, you'd be a redshirt freshman. And they would actually reverse the order. So the, if you have two quarterbacks that would come in the same class, <clears throat> for instance, the better quarterback would actually redshirt <laughs> in those days. They preferred to keep the best players back a year developing and let the guys who they didn't think were going to maybe be as good be on special teams or be the backups, and then their careers are over earlier, which is interesting, and it still would work today, except kids nowadays are totally different. They all want to play right away. There's a recruit I talked to yesterday that his main goal is a 2023 kid. His main goal, you know, I asked these kids, what do you want from a college program the first time I talked to them? Because they all have different answers. But most of the time, it's good academics and good football. This kid, the only thing he said <laughs> was, I want to play early. And I'm still writing that story up. So, you know, I'm not going to give it all away. But it's that's the mindset of a lot of these student athletes nowadays that are coming out of high school. They don't care about helping the team where they go. They don't care about necessarily development. They don't want to be a backup. They don't want to sit. They don't want to be bored, I guess, is a terminology. with You watch movies nowadays. It's all these action-packed movies. I tried to show my kids some of these old movies. Pretty Try to show your kids, for those of you that are out there with teenagers, if you have girls, show them, or boys, it doesn't matter anymore, Pretty in Pink, Breakfast Club. They, they will not make it through the first 10 minutes. It's a different type of kid now. They want immediate, immediate, immediate gratification. It's very difficult. And so that's why we have a list of, what is it, 80%, 70% of the early signees that we're saying probably will play right away in some capacity. Now, our story is on the two deep. And thanks for not interrupting me, Gary. I'll talk all day. <laughs> our story is on the two deep. 
Trying to and behave I, myself over here. The ones I the ones I personally think for sure will play. Okay, like, for sure in the two. If I start to fall asleep, I'm just going to put these glasses on. Yeah, that's great. I'll just I'll, I'll wrap up. The ones I think for sure will be in the two deep: the Saints, Graves, Kelly, and that's that's really it for me because I could see Skinner being the third tight end. I could see Markeith maybe being behind Ballum and somebody else. I could see, and that's assuming that James Williams moves to linebacker. By the way. I could see Kamari Rogers maybe yeah, not being. James Williams is going for that, but go ahead. Well, we'll we'll tackle that another time with an emphasis on the word tackle. He needs to improve. That'll, be another, that'll be another Y at the yeah. year, I think. Well, by the way, do you, do you know what his tackling grade was from Pro Football Focus? By the way, James Williams last I'm year. Sure, it wasn't very good. Fifty-four. It was one of the worst on the teams, and yeah. I want him to move to linebacker. There's just I don't understand why it was so bad, and his coverage grade was seventy-eight, which was I think third on the team. Because in the open so, field, he's he you know he t- he takes bad angles. He, it's not the bad angles, by the way. What I remember him doing a lot is just he would just hit the guy without wrapping up. He was so used to in high school just hit somebody and they fall down, you know, because mm-hmm. he was that much better in high school. But I think his tackling grade is going to go through the roof this year. He's going to get add weight. I think he should be at linebacker, but that's going to be another discussion. Yeah, we'll have to we'll do that another day. But I, yeah, but I, yeah, I, I agree. I, I think he'd be a much more effective linebacker than a free safety. But you know, we'll see. Yeah, and then Horton, I think, could easily be not in the two deep. But we're projecting the two deep as a as a, as a fun item. Gary and I got together. We decided, look, these are guys who certainly could be helping the team this year in the two deep. So we put them on the two deep. If you want to disagree, that's what this is about. I, I would actually disagree with our own story on several of them, like I just said, which I don't usually do. Like, I wrote the story with Gary, and I would disagree on some of them, but it is what it is. We're having fun. It's January. You know, the season doesn't start for eight eight months. So, uh, look, I mean, it's certainly a good subject to talk about the bot. The bottom line is this, the roster needs fortification. If this recruiting year and the class and the kids that are signed in all different ways, shapes and forms are going to be looked at to do that. And, um, it began with the early signing period. It's going to continue now in the next few weeks with the rest of the, of the class. All right. So we've got that story today. Um, let's talk next about, um, we've got, We've got a few recruiting items today. Um, let's talk about uh, five-star Texas A&M commit linebacker Harold Perkins, um, just a beast of a linebacker. He committed to Texas A&M at the Under Armour All-American game. Uh, but immediately after his commitment, in bizarre fashion, admitted that he still planned to visit Miami, might even visit Florida as well, and uh, likes the idea of Mario Cristobal as head coach. Um Matt, how how serious do you is this kid just playing? Is he just taking vacations, or the, does does Miami have a legit shot to, to turn this guy? It's funny you say in bizarre fashion because nothing is bizarre in recruiting anymore. They no, but they, come on, you go on national TV and you, and you say, "Hey, I'm going to Texas A and M," and then five minutes later, but I'm going to visit Miami and I might even visit Florida. I mean, that's. You know, that's bizarre. I think it's bizarre, but I don't think in the context of modern day recruiting, it's that out of the ordinary. I think it's going to become quite ordinary, as a matter of fact, moving forward, because these kids nowadays, they want the limelight of announcing at an all-star game, even if they're not ready to announce, which obviously he's not, because he's going to not only visit Miami and Florida, but he never had said this before. He's also now looking to visit LSU. So the kid's obviously going to... Just maybe they, you can call them vacation visits if you want to. Uh, basically, when you do what he did, I would just, in, in, in my terminology, I'd say Texas A&M is the leader. Shamar Stewart could have committed to Texas A&M the same way. It wouldn't be any different. These next three schools are going to be hammering on Texas A&M and why he shouldn't go there versus why he should go to their school. So it's almost a disservice when a kid commits to one school at this point because all the other schools can just gang up on that one school and explain this is why you shouldn't go there. So it's going to be really interesting to see because I, I, it. what's interesting to me isn't whether they can flip Harold Perkins or what Harold Perkins did. What's interesting to me over these next few weeks is if Mario Cristobal can stop making five-star visits to Miami in January vacations, like I think is the word you used. These need to be real shots. And when Miami was great back in the day, they would get these visitors on campus and they would not let the kids on campus who they were able to figure out were taking vacation visits. The last thing you want is using a kid, I want to say, 
in a way, it's, it's just peripheral. But basically, you have a kid on campus who doesn't, who doesn't want to be there for the right reason. Right. He wants to be there to party and to go to the beach. And yeah. you don't want him around the other kids no. that are there to find out what Miami's all about. It's an unusual year. It is. Um, and they, they don't have the depth of relationships with these kids that they would normally have. So they're going to have to take some shots this year. Uh, you know, and if you're going to take a shot, why not with a five-star linebacker from, from Texas that you know is going to be a great player? I mean... So I have no problem. What, what I'm trying to say is they need to make sure he's serious. I don't care if he's a five star or a one star. I don't want kids visiting that aren't serious about coming to Miami. If if you hear from people around him, oh, he's just coming down with his girlfriend to hang out on the beach. I don't want you here, like man. Bear Alexander did, for example. Right. When, when I don't he, want you he here. Took, when he took the visit. Too many coaches in the last three cycles, three cycles, three regimes have allowed this to happen where – it's just, okay, come down, have fun. It's all good. We'll pay for your steak. We understand you're not going to come, but just come check us out with no expectation you're coming. No, Mario Cristobal has to be sure that there's an expectation that there's a realistic chance that this kid will wind up at Miami. If he finds out a kid has no interest in, in going to the state of Florida, for instance, from people around the kid, guidance counselors, whatever, these past regimes did not do their homework. In the old days, you talked to the guidance counselors. I mean, they used to joke about talking to the, to the janitors are they, is the kid nice to the janitor? Is he mean to the janitor? Because Randy Shannon brought that. Yeah, that's Randy <laughs> Shannon's thing. Exactly. These these are the things that great coaching staffs do in an evaluation. It's not just look at the tape. And by the way, do look at Howard Perkins' tape because this kid, it's one of the best tapes. And I'm not an evaluator. I'm a, more of a reporter than an evaluator. But it's one of those tapes that just jumps off the screen. There was one, I think the second play, where he almost just touches a guy. And the guy goes flying like 10 yards backwards, which... I thought it was actually kind of comical. Um, I couldn't have paid someone to jump as far backwards as, as this kid did when Harold Perkins hit him. But you, again, you, you don't want to waste your time on kids. You don't want kids like that around other recruits who are serious about Miami because they pollute the atmosphere. It's almost like having a team with a bad apple in the midst of it. You don't yeah. want that. And I'm not saying yeah, Harold Perkins is like that. your recruiting of the, of the kids that are serious. Correct. You want only serious kids because they're trying to learn about the school and not party and go to the beach with you. Okay. Howard Perkins very well may be serious, but they need to make sure that every kid they bring in in January is serious about Miami, serious about helping the Miami Hurricanes, and there's a shot with every single one of them. I'm sick of these kids who come in for vacations and go home and just don't wind up here. It's frustrating to fans. It's frustrating to the program, and it hurts recruiting because when they're around these other kids, you don't think they talk? The kid's like, I'm not coming here. I'm going wherever. I'm just here for the beach. Do you think another recruit wants to hear that? Right. Are we serious about Miami? It pollutes the whole visit. And I've heard this from other kids before. This is not me making this up this has happened many times over the last numerous years from these kids that they let come in for no other reason than have a vacation all right um in addition today we take a look at a couple 2023 recruits uh a four-star defensive end who has received a miami offer by the name of uh, rico walker from the north carolina area and um also we have an update on miami central wide receiver uh lamar seymour uh, uh brother of lawrence seymour and uh you know, kind of update things with him that kind of like are a little wishy-washy, quite frankly, because of the coaching change. But now with Brian McClendon officially on board, I imagine that Lamar Seymour will be one of the first kids that he engages with. And, you know, we'll see if he fits into the plans of this regime. I wouldn't assume anything like, you know, he's, he's going to have to be reevaluated now and they're going to have to make a decision on where he fits in the grand scheme of things in 2023 recruiting. Um, so that's going to be it for right now. Um, we also have coverage of the Miami Syracuse game last night. I'll tell you a funny story, Matt. You know, I, I, I get, you know, just do fairly regular radio appearances around the country and stuff. I can't remember the last time I ever got asked to come on a talk show about a basketball game. And uh, yes, you know, yesterday uh, a, a radio station in New York called me and asked me if I'd come on their show to talk about Miami basketball. And, uh, I thought that was kind of cool, you know. I mean, obviously, we do it a lot with football. Um, can't wait! Can't wait to see the ratings come out for that station. Wow! It was, like, it was and it was long. It was like they, they they like kept pounding me with questions. I mean, it was like 20, 25 minutes. It was like you know, it, it, it was like it, you know, they were trying to get a scouting report or something. So, I mean, listen. Was, full, full disclosure: my wife's sister went to Syracuse. My wife is a huge, huge Syracuse basketball fan. She has turned my son somehow into a Syracuse basketball fan. And I pray that none of you saw them last night at the game because they were rooting for Syracuse. I'm sorry. I couldn't help. I couldn't do it. I, 
I took my son to every Miami game when he was growing up. I took him. He was in that cane thing where you'd go with the, the, the mini canes camp. He was in the camp with Jim Laranaga's camp. Like, where actual Miami Hurricane basketball players were coaching my son. And he's going to the freaking game. He went to the freaking game last night in Roots for Syracuse. Like, I, I lock, I'm changing the locks. They're not allowed in the house anymore. Like, what is wrong with these people? <laughs> All right, well, that's going to do it for today, everybody. Um, keep an eye on the website. Uh, there could start being some news here on the coordinator front in the coming hours and days. Um, we believe that uh, it's getting close. Ex- expecting a, a defensive coordinator hire maybe this week. Uh, offensive coordinator hire maybe by early next week. If not, the end of this week, we'll see how that plays out. Um, so a lot of things happening uh, in, under the Mario Cristobal transition regime at the U. So for Matt Chodell, I'm Gary Furman. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Good Morning Kane Sport. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody.